Hello and good morning. And this is Have a Survey. Uh, we are getting towards the end of this unit on the Baroque period. I have sent you several emails today, mostly dealing with St. Paul's Cathedral in London, which was constructed during this period of time uh, by Christopher, architect Christopher Wren, uh, following the Great Fire of London in the 17th century. Uh, I am starting to learn that uh, a lot of people are missing my uh, videos because the, for some reason I'm on a different channel now. I'm on my home channel. Uh, you know, who knew? Uh, but yeah, uh, this is me broadcasting from home. I'll try to put out an email to that effect so that we can make sure. Um, as you know, Friday we are having this next test uh, that is scheduled. Do not miss it. Do not miss the test from 7 a.m. Friday till 11.59 p.m. Friday. Uh, that is your next test, and uh, I am not going to be very forgiving at all for somebody who, for some reason, just can't take it. I mean, that's 17 hours you have to take a test that'll pro that takes you, I think, 30 minutes. Surely you can find that time out of your day. Uh, and so, uh, yes, let us begin uh, concluding this chapter. Uh, where are we? Yes. So, um, talking about Roman numeral six here in the uh, your study guide. Uh, talk, still talking about Louis the Fourteenth, the Sun King. Louis the Fourteenth, the man who said, "Lay a state, c'est moi. I am the state." Uh, but Louis the Fourteenth was also what he what was called at the time an enlightened despot, meaning basically the word enlightened despot it means smart king. It means uh, a king who at the time you know the intellectual movement of the time was the Enlightenment, which means uh, a period of time when people began to question everything that had ever been taught by the Roman Catholic Church, a uh, period of time when people sought to uh, discover uh, the scientific reason for everything, logic. And we're going to, actually, we're going to talk about the Enlightenment more in the next chapter. But anyway, Louis XIV considered himself an enlightened despot, and an enlightened despot, and there are several of these, um, Joseph II of Austria, who is called the musical king, uh, Frederick the Great of Prussia, Catherine the Great of Russia, who think of themselves as being enlightened. In other words, having accepted the new scientific way of thinking of the 18th century. Uh, and so, yeah. But, so it means smart king. Um he, Louis XIV, encouraged and patronized theater and dance. Even, and this is worth noting for your test, Louis XIV performed in the ballet himself. All right. What is ballet? We've actually talked about this a little bit before. But ballet is a theatrical performance where instead of the means of expression, is primarily vocal. It is not. And it does, ballet, of course, does contain music, but ballet is a type of theater performance where the primary expression of the art is the dance. Very, very athletic dance. Um, I mean, in my opinion, I think the best athletes in the world are dancers. And of those dancers, the best athletes in the world are the ballet dancers. The things that they put their bodies through, uh, you know, um, the physical, uh, the jumping, but also the standing on point, the ballet positions, the stretching, uh, literally, to be honest, 
you don't see any ballet dancers hardly over the age of 30. It's too hard on the body, the pounding that your body takes uh, for that. Very rare. And so, yeah, so Louis XIV himself performed in the ballet. Now, was he good? Um, he thought he was good. And I'm sure everybody around him thought, uh, said he was good. But anyway, so ballet was a Renaissance era invention of the Italians. Italy invented the ballet. However, today, when we say the word ballet, we think of French ballet. In other words, the French took the art form of the ballet and because of Louis XIV, expanded it and made it to more where when people talk about the ballet day, they don't only think of Italy, they think of France and later on Russian, the Russian ballet. Uh, why? Because well, the French made changes. For example, the French allowed women in the ballet and the French also um, shortened, they basically shortened up the uniform they, you know, they made the dresses shorter. They made the tights more uh, to where you could move around in them, to where you could do the difficult jumps and the leaps and things like that uh, under Louis XIV. But uh, the Italians had only allowed men to perform uh, because the dance move were considered immoral for women because, you have, you know, if you ever watch ballet, they do a lot of, uh, you know, uh, spreading of their legs and leaping and, you know, it might be interpreted as being revealing. But anyway, the French, particularly at Versailles with Louis XIV's patronage, took over ballet and made it their own. Women became regular performers and it also became more athletic. Uh, like I said, they shortened up the uniform, uh, the gowns that the women uh, would wear. Uh, since French ballet was sponsored by the king, then it had to ad adhere to the regulations of the king in both content and format. You say, what does that mean? Well, it means that it couldn't put out anything out there that was in opposition to the official position of Louis XIV. And by the way, Louis XIV uh, was an ardent Roman Catholic. A very ardent Roman Catholic. But yeah, um, whereas the opera was the Italian national theater form. Ballet became the French national form of theatrical art. And once again, going forward, people think of it as a French form of art, as if that were going to be on a test. Um, the great Jean-Baptiste Pocayen, better known as Moliere, which is the way his name will appear on your test, Moliere, was a playwright who pioneered in writing French ballet. He actually died during a performance. Now, not performing, he you know, was in the audience, had a heart attack or whatever. He is renowned as a great critic of French society, particularly of its nobility and the social climbers. Okay, moving forward. In the 17th century, now we're talking about painters of the northern part of Europe, the Baroque painters of the northern part of Europe continued under the names of such people as Peter Paul Rubens, and uh, who was from Belgium, and Nicolas Poussin of France. Uh, Rubens was responsible for Henry IV uh, receiving the portrait of Marie de Medici and the rape of the daughters of Lesipus. And yes, I, you don't have your book, and so you can't look at that. Um, Spoiler alert, it's not going to be on your test anyway. Poussin created the Holy Family on the Steps. Okay, now back. Uh, in Northern Europe, which was dominated by the Protestant churches, the Baroque period focused uh, on a more humanistic slant uh, that began in the Renaissance period. And also, the Protestant churches of the North, remember, they went through and they cleansed their churches of all the Catholic, uh, you know, decorations, all the color, all the stained glass windows, all the icons were torn down. Uh, and in the North, the Baroque movement focused 
in the churches, more on music. Yes. Uh, and here we get to see our first classical musician. And by the way, I just sent you an email um, regarding Johann Sebastian Bach. Um, Bach, uh, his great classical piece, you know, there's actually a listing of the top 100 classical pieces of music of all time. Uh, and uh, the greatest classical music piece of all time is called Toccata, or rather, Bach's greatest. It's actually the fourth. Bach is number four. Beethoven has number one, but Bach has number four. Uh, Bach's most famous uh, classical piece is something called Toccata and Fugue. Which I just sent, which I sent you about, I don't know, 30 minutes or 45 minutes ago. Yeah, Toccata and Few. And I sent you the entire piece. It's a nine minute piece. Um, try to get through two minutes of it. You know, I like classical music, uh, uh, but I can also understand if first time you hear it, you go, Ugh. but I mean, for one thing, you notice in the Toccata and Few that box piece is uh box piece is uh very similar to the theme music of a haunted house nah, 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 you know like that uh but yeah uh, it's called Takata and fugue i sent you that earlier in an email so you know enjoy i will admit you know classical music is one of those things like art that when i began teaching this class i didn't know anything about and didn't want to know anything about I mean, trust me, don't think, sit there and think, well, you know, this Horton guy, he just messed up. He's crazy because he actually likes art. When I began the class, I didn't care much of any kind of art. <clears throat> but um, since, I mean, you know, exposure causes you to like something. It's kind of like a Stockholm syndrome with art. Uh, you know, if you're exposed to it long enough, you begin to identify with it. And, um, Yes, there are pieces of classical music, which we're going to talk about in the next chapter, pieces of classical music that I do like. And uh, Takana and Fugue is okay, but there are other pieces I prefer much more, and we'll talk about them later on. And I think that if you give them a chance, you know, you'll not hate them, not just despise them, as I used to do. So anyway, back to the matter at hand. Um, yes, Johann Sebastian Bach, Toccata and Fugue, which is what I sent you. Uh, Bach did no operas. Say again, Bach did no operas, uh, as did Mozart and Beethoven. Mozart and Beethoven did operas. In fact, Mozart was prolific. Mozart is, he doesn't have the number one. Uh, classical music piece, but he has more classical music pieces in the top 100 than anybody else. Mozart was a machine. He was an alien. He was from another planet. Uh, he was, if LeBron James and Michael Jordan had a love child uh, of music, it'd be Mozart. He just, you know, understood music on another plane. And I'll talk more about him in the next chapter, but yeah. Yeah, if we were going to be going to school, we would watch all of Amadeus. And we're going to watch bits and pieces of it now. I mean, after spring break. So, but anyway, getting back to Johann Sebastian Bach. Sebast Johann Sebastian Bach um, wrote St. Matthew Passion, which called for two orchestras, organs and solo voices. Uh, in the Netherlands, the new Dutch Republic, artists would be bankrolled not by the church anymore, but by a group of businessmen, a variety of sources. And these sources demanded and received a more humanistic style of painting. The, this is when we get into the so-called Dutch masters type paintings. And you know what I'm talking about when I say Dutch masters. The cigar boxes with like uh, five or six guys sitting around with the black and white, the hats. Uh, those are considered the Dutch masters. 
And yeah, if you notice there, I have that word genre paintings again. It means paintings of paintings of uh, everyday life. The most remarkable of the Dutch genre painters were Johan Vermeer. Uh, Vermeer did the the famous Milkmaid, and yes, I'll have to send you that one after I finish with this. Johan Vermeer's Milkmaid. In fact, if you uh, have been in our class, Mr. Niehaus, you sat right under Johann Vermeer's Milkmaid. One of our students recreated that for me. Um, Rembrandt von Rijn is the most famous of all the Dutch Baroque painters. Rembrandt's. You know, paintings are simply often called Rembrandt's. Um, Rembrandt began his career when Rembrandt was one of those very odd people in art. Most artists uh, in art begin impoverished, and the ones you remember end their lives in wealth, like Michelangelo, although he wasn't impoverished, uh, but like Picasso, for example, like, uh, um, oh, what, what's his name? He shot himself, uh, De not Degas. Uh, people always mispronounce his name. Uh, Van Gogh. Yeah, his, his name is Van Gogh, not Van Gogh. But yeah, but Rembrandt, test question, Rembrandt actually, when he began his career, he was a wealthy young man. And by the time he died, he was in poverty. And so, but his whole life, uh, he painted. His career lost its appeal because people's taste changed. Although, Artists often out, uh, are outlived by their art. Say again, artists are often outlived by their art. And it is very common, test question, it is very common that artists are not appreciated in their own lifetimes and that they, um, they become more famous after they die. Quite famous, quite uh, true. Uh, it's true in music, it's true in art that, you know, when artists, uh, oftentimes, when artists pass on, since their works won't be produced anymore, people uh, place more value on their art. So, back to the matter at hand. Um, <clears throat> oftentimes, uh, artists are not appreciated during their own lifetimes. Note, uh, yes, Rembrandt painted the Christ Healing the Sick, which was a uh, a ink print and a hundred guilder print, which is called a hundred guilder print because that's what it costs when he made it. It's a type of work where lines are scratched on a wax covered metal plate and then prints are taken from the plate. Okay, during the Baroque period, a new philosophy, way of thinking, way of looking at the world was developing in such a manner that had not been seen since the days of the ancient Greeks, thinkers. This is the age of science and reason, which I just alluded to. It was only a matter of time until such thinking and recreating would be reflected in the world of art. It became fashionable during this period of time to accept truths that only could be proven by reason and the scientific method. Reasoning from observation, also called induction or inductive reasoning, became the way to gain knowledge. On your test, Rene Descartes, he, uh, his uh, famous phrase, cognito ergo sum. Cognito ergo sum. You say, what does that mean? It literally means, I think, therefore I am. It was the basic philosophy of the Enlightenment. In other words, during the Enlightenment, people, thinkers, were taught to uh, people were taught to doubt everything, to not accept anything. Well, if you don't accept anything as truth, how do you know anything's real? I mean, you know, I mean, how do you know the universe is real? How do you know what you're experiencing is real? How do you know that uh, if you're taught to challenge everything? And finally, uh, 
Rene Descartes gets down to it and he says, if I'm thinking, then I must exist. I must be a being. And then he goes on and extrapolates an entire philosophy from the idea that if I'm thinking, therefore I exist. <clears throat> this period became known as the age of reason and begins with Newton's discovery of universal gravitation. 1687, that's also a test question, by the way. The age of reason begins with Newton's universe, uh, Newton's uh, publication of his theory of universal gravitation and ends in 1789 with the French Revolution, uh, basically a hundred years uh, in the offing. And why it begins with the uh, French Revolution, because in the French Revolution, basically, they take reason and twist it so much, they try to apply reasoning to everything, literally everything. And we'll get more uh, to that later on. But yeah, it begins with Newton's theory of universal gravitation and ends with the French Revolution of 1789. And we will talk more about the age of reason in the next chapter. So... Um, because of England's political situation, having just emerged from a civil war and holding great distrust for the entanglements of continental Europe, England was neither an artistic innovator nor an architectural one. For example, Christopher Wren, London, the cathedral, St. Paul's Cathedral in London, the architect of that, he was a, really an amateur. <coughs> I mean... <coughs> Pardon me. The uh, St. Paul's Cathedral is ginormous. You know, it's a miracle of architecture. And yet it doesn't adhere to one particular style. In the front, it looks like neoclassical. Uh, in throughout the hall, it looks gothic. Uh, you know, it's kind of a mess, but it's really big. And so, yeah. George Friedrich Handel, uh, who lived in England, but he wrote the musical piece, The Messiah, which is normally played during Easter upcoming, uh, was an implant from Germany. And yeah, he was in England, but he was from Germany. England, however, did excel in theatrical and literary arts. Uh, Christopher Wren, like I said, St. Paul's Cathedral, the great fire of London of the 17th century, 1666, basically forced Wren's hand into rebuilding the large church in all of England. But if you know anything, and once again, I went to St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, there's like a small trench. It's about this deep. Runs across the floor. And it says that if you put St. Paul's Cathedral in here, this is where it would come to. In other words, it would fit in here. Uh, so, he utilized both Gothic and Baroque styles in his architecture. George Friedrich Handel, who wrote The Messiah, commanded the Royal Academy of Music. Yes, he wrote The Messiah. The Messiah counts Jesus' birth, death, and resurrection. Ah, yes, John Locke. John Locke, your friend and mine, John Locke. Okay. Last thing we're going over for this unit. What will we do tomorrow? I'll send you some more videos to help you appreciate uh, this art and just check in with you briefly. John Locke wrote the very important paper, Two Treatises on Government. This document says that there exists a social contract between the government and the governed. Social contract theory. You know, the social contract theory of government had actually been around for quite some time. You say, well, what's the social contract theory? The social contract theory uh, says that when people are under a government, there exists a contract between the government and the people. And when you have a contract, you agree to do something if the other party agrees to do something else. Uh, for example, you know, if I told you 
that I would give I would give you an A if I you know pull one of you aside and told you hey I'll give you an A and you don't have to do a thing for this class ever 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 uh, if you give me five hundred dollars and so for the entire quarter you don't do anything for the class and then at the end of the quarter comes around and you look at your grade in infant campus and it reads a big fat zero. And I give you a call and said, Hey, where's my $500? And what do you say? You say, Hey, you did not uphold your end of the contract. Therefore you don't get $500. So, and basically that's how the contract between the government and the governed, that's us, works. The government agrees to do certain things, and the governed, that's us, agree to do certain things. Well, let's see. What do we agree to do? We agree to obey the law. We agree to pay taxes. Um, and that's about it. Yeah, obey the law. And, of course, now that law might include, for example, being drafted into the armed services, uh, you know, it, and various and sundry other things. But yeah, obey the law. The government, what does it agree to do? The government agrees to protect the citizens from foreign enemies, from each other. I mean, that's one of the Boone County sheriffs running up and down the roads. And that, people had known that for a long time. Governmental philosophers, people who wrote about government had known that and agreed to that forever, for quite a long time. And uh, so the, the uh, social contract theory of government is really nothing new, except John Locke said, oh yes, the government also has the responsibility of protecting you from the government itself. Run, run that back. The government has the job, have accepted the responsibility, according to John Locke, that the government has to protect you from the government. In other words, the government cannot abuse your rights. And so, if you understand that, then the government should not take away certain freedoms without due process. And look what it says in the study guide. If the government, if the governed do not do what they're supposed to do, what happens to them? They lose their freedom. <clears throat> they lose their treasure, like being fined. They get put in jail. They might be a fine. Or in the worst case scenario, they are executed. That's what the government does to them. Locke said, however, what if the government doesn't do what it's supposed to? For example, what if the government doesn't protect you from foreign enemies? What if the government doesn't protect you from each other? Or what if the government doesn't um, protect you from the government? I need some more of this. Um, and the answer is that the people have a right to form a new government. If the government doesn't do what it says it will do, the people have a right to form a new government. And John Locke said, <coughs> see if this sounds familiar, all men are endowed with certain natural rights. Natural rights. And among these are life, liberty, and property. Perhaps you've heard that before, or something similar. Please tell me you have. And I mean, it's one of my favorite peeves. It's one of my favorite peeves of the entire year. It's one of my favorite peeves of the entire year. And that is that Thomas Jefferson gets credit for that. When Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, he plagiarized John Locke. What did Thomas Jefferson say? He said that uh, all men are created with certain, and Thomas Jefferson says, inalienable rights. 
that amongst these are life, liberty, and Thomas Jefferson says the pursuit of happiness. And you might say, you know, well, I mean, it's plagiarism. You know, if Tom, Thomas Jefferson had turned that paper into me, I would have written him up for plagiarism. And so, yeah. Um, and there it is. That's the end of our chapter. We're going to talk a little bit more tomorrow. I'll check in with you, but I'll also be sending you primarily some uh, pictures uh, some uh, and some things of, for example, the work of the Baroque painters. Yes. Uh, one last thing. Um, I'm still struggling with Canvas, and uh, here's the announcement. I will not be changing, I will not be letting people take tests late because, well, when I do, I have found out the hard way that it wipes out all the test grades of the people who took it on time. Say again, do not ask me to take a test that you blew off. I give you plenty of time to take a test. Your next test is Friday, 7 in the morning to 11.59 at night. I don't think that that's an unreasonable request to ask you if you can make 30 minutes or, you know, to dedicate 30, 35 minutes to taking this test. And by the way, so Friday, your test, which will be the only thing you have to do in here, uh, will happen. And so with that, yes, I'm going to log out. I will check back with you in the morning. Uh, I'll have some more pictures for you to look at. Uh, but until then, have a good day. Stay safe.